Good morning, everyone, and welcome again to the Federated Computing Research Conference, the ninth conference in the series of this Federated Conference uh, event since 1993, 30 years ago. I am Timothy Pinkston from the University of Southern California and chair of FCRC this year. As I mentioned yesterday, FCRC brings together many different affiliated research conferences and associated workshops during uh, this week-long co-located co event with 14 conferences this year in the CRA as well, with two independent workshops from the CRA. Today, we welcome the start of Sigmetrics, Stock, and Potsy. Several conferences and partners affiliated with FCRC this year are celebrating milestone years. ISCA celebrating its 50th, CRA celebrating its 50th, and Stock celebrating its 55th, and many others. We look forward to all of our conferences continuing to thrive well into the future. We have approximately 2,600 attendees this year at FCRC with representation from over 50 countries and with nearly 20% women attendees. We look forward to growth along these and other important demographic dimensions well into the future as well. I again ask everyone to please be mindful that FCRC promotes openness and inclusiveness. FCRC is a safe place for the free exchange of research results and ideas, for rich intellectual discourse, and for open scholarly interactions. We support a welcoming environment for all to thrive that lives up to the ACM's core values which promote diversity, equity, and inclusion. And again, I wish to thank all of our corporate and academic FCRC sponsors for their generous support this year. Futureway Technologies in the USC Viterbi School of Engineering as platinum sponsors. Google at the gold level, Meta and Samsung at the silver level, and Alibaba, Cloud, Amazon, Pathway, Springer, VMware, and the University of Virginia School of Engineering and Applied Sciences at the bronze level. It is through the generous support of our sponsors that we're able to provide such a strong program as we have this year. With this, I'd like to uh, bring to the po podium our uh, plenary speakers chair, Dilma Da Silva. Hello, everyone. I'm Dilma Da Silva. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And uh, I am from Texas A&M University, and I'm currently serving at the National Science Foundation. And because I'm wearing the same hat that my speaker this time, I asked Timothy to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Dilma. I also forgot to mention my preferred pronouns are he, him, and his. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce our plenary speaker for this session, Professor Margaret Martinosi. Margaret is the Hugh Trumbull Adams Professor of Computer Science at Princeton University and currently serves as the Assistant Director for Computer and Information Science and Engineering, or SIZE, at the U.S. National Science Foundation, or NSF. Margaret is a highly accomplished researcher with, with research interests that span computer architecture and hardware software interface issues in classical and more recently and profoundly in quantum computing. She has served as a Jefferson Science Fellow at the US uh, State Department and is an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, as well as the US National Academy of Engineering, or NAE. Two years ago, she received the ACM IEEE C.S. Eckert Mockley Award for her contributions in power aware computing. Margaret is also a recipient of the Grace Hopper Celebration of Women in Computing Techn uh, Technical Leadership Award and is a recipient of the ACM Sigarch Allen D. Berenbaum Distinguished Service Award. One of the co-founders 
and inaugural co-chair of Sig Arch, Sig Micro's CARES Committee, Margaret has been an inspiration and supporter of countless many who hopefully will follow her distinguished path of both technical as well as uh, pro professional service leadership. Please join me in warmly welcoming to the stage our second plenary speaker for FCRC, Professor Margaret Martinesi. It's all good until someone closes your laptop. <laughs> I you love you, someone Timothy. From technical, someone from technical support who can come? So that looks good. <clears throat> it's, it's good. Okay. Oh, that's your slide. Someone from technical support is coming. Is that it? Is that it? It could be, but I don't see it on the screen. Hmm. There. Nope. Oh. Okay. Great. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, nothing like a little bit of uh, PowerPoint uh, snafu to start the talk. Uh, it's wonderful to be here today, and I thank Timothy for the kind introduction. We've known each other for over 30 years, and actually um, that brings me to something I wanted to say here at the beginning, which is I was a graduate student at the first FCRC in 1993. I presented some of the pieces of my dissertation work uh, in Sigmetrics that year, and to come to FCRC and to have that experience of both presenting my own work in one conference, but also sharing experiences and topic areas across so many other conferences was a really formative, transformative uh, opportunity for me. And so I think what I'm gonna talk about here today is really how might we take that even further when we federate the 15 or so research conferences that we have here today. This is awesome, right? 2,600 of us in the same room talking about related but distinct topic areas. Um, but how might we do more uh, going forward? And, and so this isn't going to be the most technical plenary talk you will hear this week. It's probably not by far going to be the most technical talk you'll hear this week. Um, this talk I view as a call to action for all of us. And um, in particular, I'm pretty sure that there's a fifth year graduate student out there who's wondering how the paper they're presenting here today might actually change the world. Because while they're really proud of that work, they may not see the steps, the linkages to having the kind of societal impact that they aspire to. And so I'm hoping that as a community, maybe it's that fifth year grad student, maybe it's someone who just got tenure and it's like, now what am I gonna do, right? For all of us, for all of them, I'm asking us as a community to come together and think about how we, might we do more? How might we federate beyond FCRC to reach out more broadly um, and to really take on impact um, at a grand societal scale? And so I am speaking um, with the affiliation of the US National Science Foundation. We're the major funder of computer science research in America. Um, but I'm really speaking as a member of this community uh, I'm going to give you examples that are drawn out of NSF's portfolio, but I'm sure you can think of your own examples of impact and of opportunity. And the point is, how might we make more of that happen? Uh, what else could we do to make it easier? Uh, so with that, uh, here we go. I have three grand challenges here on the slide. And let me just say, uh, my voice is a little weird today, but uh, it was even weirder yesterday or the day before. So let's just... Um, Hope that it holds for the next hour or so. 
Uh, so with that, three societal grand challenges. Uh, climate and sustainability. How might we expand the frontiers of knowledge and technology for a more sustainable future? Second one, trust in information. How best to provide trustworthy and meaningful access for inform to information? How to provide privacy where that is the appropriate approach? How to provide access when that's the appropriate approach? And that last question at the bottom of this category is really important. What is truth anyway? How do we discern truth when information is presented to us? How do we assess the integrity of the information we're interacting with on the internet and in our everyday lives mediated by technologies? Uh, the third grand challenge that I have here on the slide is about people, um, because I think we can look around this room. This is my community. This is our community. I love you all, um, but I think we can look around this room and say, we could be more inclusive in engaging the world's full talents in our work. There's key demographics where we're not pulling in talent at the representation levels that we could. And I view that as a grand challenge for computing as well. So you can look at this list of three and you could say, oh, I have some other ones, why didn't she list them? You could say, why didn't she list health? Uh, especially given what her voice sounds like right now. Um, <clears throat> And indeed, I think the reason why I didn't list health is clearly a grand challenge for society. Um, in the way US science funding agencies um, operate, there is a different US science funding agency with the mission to sort of uh, the mandate to look over human health research. That's the National Institutes of Health. So with my NSF hat on today, I'm sort of focusing on three different challenges that really span NSFs, all of science, basic science, uh, mission with a particular focus on the computer and information science and engineering topic space, partly because that's the community that we are all here, and partly because that's the directorate that I lead at NSF. So what I'm going to do in the first part of the talk is to tell some stories. Uh, I think one of the most rewarding things for me at NSF, but I hope also for you as members of the community, is to see some examples where Investing in work and in people long term over decades has led to really, um, in some cases, uh, narrow but deep impacts, and in other cases, just broad societal impacts. And it's nice to take stock and see them. And so, what I'm going to do is cycle through these three challenges and give some examples of impact stories. And again, they come out of NSF's portfolio. But if you're from another country or another funding agency, you can find them too. And I'm always looking for them. So if you have more, uh, send me an email. I really mean it. So let's look at climate and sustainability first. Um, here's an impact story. Recently, just in the past year or so, uh, some NSF-funded researchers published a paper about reducing the adverse impacts of hydropower in the Amazon. So as we all know, the Amazon River is this profoundly important ecosystem for the world, right? It's the Earth's largest and most biodiverse river basin. There's also a lot of people that live there, and those people need electricity. So planning how to use the river and the ecosystem resources for people's needs as well as for ecosystem protection requires the most intelligent analysis that we can bring to it. And that's what people in this room can do, right? So what they did in this particular study uh, was they used AI-based multi-objective optimization to identify many candidate dam development sites and assess their environmental impacts while still meeting energy production goals. And I want to sort of step back and sort of analyze this impact story from a few different directions. So first of all, did we fund one person in 2021 to look at dams in the Amazon? No, we did not. We funded teams of people over decades to build up the different tools and the toolkit that we can deploy on things like this, on things like multi-objective optimization to different application areas. So it's that long-term view that I think is really important both for a funding agency like NSF, but also for a community, being willing to wait for things to actually reach their full potential. Um, the other thing about this is, this is a wonderful story in terms of thinking beyond individual jurisdictions. The Amazon spans many countries. We can take this kind of work and apply it to many other uh, multi-jurisdiction uh, 
studies, uh, issues that come out. So this is one. The second one, also fairly recent, this was in the New York Times just in May, uh, and on CBS News here in the US fairly recently. Um, AI-driven weather prediction for aviation logistics. Uh, how many of you had a flight delay or cancellation coming to Orlando this week? I had one of each, a cancellation followed by a delay, right? So I think, I think the motivation is clear. Um, this is a NSF-funded AI Institute for Trustworthy AI for Weather, Climate, and Coastal Oceanography. It is a large-scale funding effort that spans about a dozen institutions, and it's working both with industry and with other federal agencies, like our Oceanographic and Atmospheric uh, Agency for Weather Issues, to understand how to build trustworthy AI models that will home in on particular problems, as well as the back-end foundational models and toolkits that will be deployed across a range of these things. Oh, so what does trust for the AI mean in this case? Actually, in this case, it's interesting because it's not about the general public believing that their model for continental scale convection flow makes sense. It's about being trustworthy to the weather scientists, the environmental scientists, who need to use those models and uh, sort of influence them. So the notion of trust for the AI is not just for the general public, although that's clearly important, but also thinking about it in a relationship-driven way for different customers. So another thing I would encourage us all to think about as a community is, are we having the right conversations with the right customers as we go from a paper at FCRC to what might be next for that work? Uh, not all of us you know, want the same kinds of impact statements to come out of our work, but thinking about who the customers are, who the users are, and how to have good relationships that lead to impact seems like a worthwhile thing to think about in general. A third impact story, this is for the sea turtle lovers that are out there, uh, and there's a lot of sea turtles in Florida. Um, this is an example of very detailed and long-term water temperature modeling uh, that was being done by researchers actually with better and better results for decades. Uh, and the motivation for this particular impact story is the following. Off the coast of Texas, there are places where there are very shallow bodies of water. One of them is called the Laguna Madre. And you can imagine that in a shallow body of water, a, a big temperature fluctuation in the air temperature leads to a very sudden change in water temperature. And if you have an endangered species that lives in that water, like sea turtles, or if you have commercially relevant fish population that live in that water, uh, then you can lose a whole bunch of them at once with one cold snap. Uh, so the idea was to develop AI forecasting that would be A, trustworthy, and B, uh, go out, say, five days in advance. Five days in advance is enough time to do something. Uh, in, in fact, in these uh, examples, they actually rescued sea turtles out of the water to, to get them someplace safe before the water temperature dropped. And they did voluntary changes to the shipping traffic to also lessen the impact on the endangered populations during these cold, stunning events. So one of the reasons for sort of trustworthy modeling in this framework is you don't want to ask all the shipping companies to um, stop their, their shipping traffic for a few days and then realize, oops, our model goofed, right? So we as researchers can take the better and better modeling, the better and better technologies that we are developing and use them both for impact in the real world, but also use them through a sort of long-term relationship building that allows us to have this impact. The other thing I will say is that the picture you see here is an undergrad researcher. So imagine what it does for our field if the folks who are doing computing research realize that their computing research can lead them to actually saving a sea turtle's life, which is what this uh, kid got to experience. So that's climate and sustainability. There's a whole lot more. We do a ton on climate. I'll get, come back to it later in sort of future work. But I wanted to get to trust and information. This is about access to information and then about privacy and trust in the hardware and software systems that we built. That we built. <clears throat> so let's start with that first part access to information. And this is a story that NSF is proud of, uh, but we also know 
uh, that we need to sort of think hard about what's next. So the story that we're proud of is this one. Uh, in 1994, we gave an award to some folks at Stanford. And a few years later, as many of you have probably experienced, you have to write that final report at the end of the, the award. And this screenshot here is to make sure you know that we actually read them. And in this case, uh, that for historic re relevance, we were actually able to make this public. The Google search engine was developed as a part of the project. It is now a company. That was in the final report in 2000. And we kept it all these years. And uh, we have some others, too. Uh, VMware, Databricks, and so on and so forth. We can dig through our portfolio and find many different at scale examples of helping to make information accessible. And we're proud of that lineage. Um, but obviously, there's another side to this, which is how do we create the trust in information access that goes with it? And a lot of that work uh, is coming along as well. So an impact story here that is really a rich story of many different contributors, but there is a strong NSF uh, sort of uh, a thread woven through it, is the impact story of differential privacy. So differential privacy is the idea that if there's a data set and uh, people are doing queries off that data set, it would be nice if you can't tell from the queries, uh, no matter how many queries you do and no matter what site information you have, it would be nice if you cannot tell whether my data is in that uh, data set or not. And in particular, what differential privacy created over a sequence of papers over a, a decade or more of really focused work uh, was the notion of a rigorous mathematical framework for reasoning about and ensuring individual privacy in aggregated data sets. And in particular, it allowed a privacy budget uh, to be considered and mathematically analyzed. And it allowed uh, implementers of differentially private techniques to think about blurring just the data that's needed in order to uh, put in just enough noise that you can't tell whether an individual is there or not there, while maintaining enough accuracy to actually continue to have useful use of the data. Uh, and so, that's great. The other thing is that you can actually think about this as a privacy budget. So if you have multiple data analytics steps, you can know how much noise you've injected at one step, and therefore how much noise you're allowed to inject at the next step in order to achieve this overall goal. One of the things that I love about differential privacy as an example, as an impact story, is if you went out into the world, if you went out of this hotel and asked people about their privacy, they would never in a million years think, a, a, a sort of random taxpayer wouldn't think that there would be a mathematical framework that would allow us to usefully manipulate and manage privacy in a way that's trustworthy. And yet there is. And it was through a long-term engagement of a broad community that we got to that. Uh, so this is a real success story. <clears throat> What's the impact? If you participated in the US Census in 2020, then you were protected by differential privacy. It was deployed in the 2020 US Census. So it went from first investments to at scale deployments in under 20 years. Uh, the other thing is that uh, many of the large tech companies uh, also use differential privacy in how they manage data inputs as well. Uh, so another impact story, another case of taking the tools in the toolkit that we are best at and figuring out how to apply them to, to really broad societal challenges. Here's another one. You might be surprised to see it in this section, but after pondering it, I decided I, I could, I, I believed it fit here. And it's the story of long-term research funding towards formal verification. So in 1979, NSF gave a grant to a fellow named Ed Clark. Uh, you may remember uh, him as a Turing Award winner, um, but he wasn't a Turing Award winner in 1979. He was a relatively young researcher. And he and his team and other collaborators, other folks working on it, came up with a notion of model checking, the idea that it would be possible to algorithmically verify system designs uh, with finite states, saving significant time compared to manual verification, and let's be honest, covering the corner cases in a more automated way. 
So model checking was great. Next step was making it more scalable. And BDDs became a key part of accomplishing that. BDDs, Randy Bryant and others were central to that. Another example of NSF funded researchers um, allowed the model checking ideas to scale out further. We could keep going. Uh, the next step, you know, sort of in this particular sequence, is that in the early 1990s, uh, NSF was uh, starting to fund a range of research awards that had to do with applying BDDs to formal verification. And I'll be honest, in the 80s and the early 90s, uh, a lot of this looked somewhat theoretical. People were really worried about the scaling. Uh, people were really worried about would companies actually use it. Um, I could give a whole other um, impact story slide on the scaling of SAT and SMT solvers and the speed advantages that people got over time that actually made some of this more viable. But what I'm gonna do here is kind of cut to the chase. What happened in 1994, the FDIV bug uh, happened and it really put a point on the need for industry to think differently about functional correctness and verification. And you know, if we had waited till 1994, and then say, oh boy, we better scramble and think about formal verification. We would not have been ready. Um, but instead, the field said, oh, we've been doing this for 20 years. Here you go. Uh, and so where are we now? This is a broad use of formal verification techniques in hardware and software companies and across many different levels of the system stack. Uh, in this, I took all the names out because I was worried if we didn't have all the names, it wouldn't look right. But in this slide, I will say, there's multiple Turing Award winners with NSF funding, and there's multiple uh, Presidential Young Investigator Award winners it, with NSF funding in this. Um, NSF's track record is that we have funded two thirds of the Turing Award winners that have ever received the Turing Award. And that's despite the fact that if you're from another country, you're probably not, not applying for NSF funding. And that's despite the fact that if you win the Turing Award winner, in industry, you probably haven't been proposing for NSF funding. So to keep up that two-thirds mark um, is a point of pride for us. It means that we are pretty okay at fostering long-term researchers, long-term impact, at least by that one measure. So these are three different versions of sort of what is trust and in information. Um, but obviously, there's an awful lot on our minds now in terms of information integrity stis and malinformation uh, that we need to get to, and I'll get to that in the next part of the talk. I want to talk a little bit about people. I have one impact story here, but it's one we're proud of. Uh, uh, let me give a little background uh, for those who are not familiar with uh, the U.S. K-12 through educational system. So before college in the U.S., that part of the educational system uh, is managed at the state and local jurisdiction level. The federal government actually has relatively little to say about the curriculum or the requirements that uh, occur state by state in our high schools and, and elsewhere in our primary schools. And so as a result, it can be very hard to effect change at scale when it comes to something like access to CS education. And so as a result, prior to 2009, um, less than half the high schools in America had a CS class, and very few US students took CS in high school. This is 2009. This is not like the dark ages, right? In most states, it wasn't offered. And here's the one that really gets me. But where it was offered, it was usually counted as an elective similar to a cooking class or a woodshop class, not science credit. Uh, and this is not ancient history. This is fairly recent. So what did NSF do? Uh, we formed a community, as we often do. Uh, we funded the College Board, which is an organization in the U.S. that develops advanced placement exams. And again, in the U.S., advanced placement or AP exams are a program that lets high school students learn something in high school and potentially get credit for it when they get to college. So it's a way of sort of providing a North Star to high schoolers about what might be useful later on. Um, we funded a new AP exam called APCS Principles. The idea was for the College Board to develop something that was less coding focused and more focused on computational thinking and on broad societal challenges. Uh, so we funded the, the, the creation of the exam 
And then we also funded them to work with dozens of CS education experts to pilot the curriculum, both at the high school and college level. In 2016, the exam launched. It was the largest launch in AP history. In fact, prior to the launch of this exam, um, AP exams in computer science, the coding focused one, was not even really in the top five of what American high school students would take as an AP exam. They take an AP calculus class, they might take an AP statistics class, but they weren't taking an AP class in computing prior to 2016. So this exam changed both in scale, who was taking AP exams, who was taking computing in high school, and also changed uh, extraordinarily the demographics of who was able to take computing in high school. Today, over 100,000 students a year take this exam. Uh, there's tremendous gender and racial and ethnic diversity in who takes the, the exam. We also are studying it over time, and we see that APCS principal students are more likely to persist in CS majors in college. And most, you know, another wonderful attribute is that that persistence is actually most prominent for groups that are traditionally underrepresented in US CS programs like women and Hispanic students. So we're proud of this. We're proud of this because at first it didn't look like we had a lever on these state by state issues. Uh, but we found the lever and we made the impact happen. And so again, back to that call for action. I hope we can look for the levers that we have as a community and build those out over time. So, what I'm going to talk about next in the second half of the talk are kind of going forward. Those are the impact stories. What's next on each of these topic areas? Um, before I do that, I just want to give like a NSF 101. How do we fund research anyway? Uh, many of you uh, might be familiar with uh, sort of the, the notion of uh, core investments. Essentially, any US professor can come to us with an idea and um, we'll, we'll We'll fund it across essentially anything in computing, and we call that our core funding. Um, but we also have other uh, types of investment programs, other types of awards that we make on things like uh, use inspired research, translation of practice. Uh, a really increasingly important thing is funding the research resources and infrastructure for the community. If you're an AI researcher, you need compute and data. If you're an architect, you need help fabricating prototypes in real semiconductors. And NSF uh, plays a strong role in making sure that those research resources and infrastructure are part of things. Um, but we also focus a lot on community building. And I mean that in terms of this crowd, right? I mean it in terms of if you want something new to take off, uh, for example, computational sustainability, how do you fund it over time to bring the right people into conversation so that it actually takes off? And that's something that NSF does both through workshops and through other mechanisms. So the question is sort of how do we go forward? Where do we go from here on each of these? Uh, when it comes to sustainability, uh, we take an approach that can be summarized by the kind of two big blocks that you see here and how they flow back and forth with each other. The left-hand side is about sustainability in computing. It's about cleaning up our own shop it's about making computing itself more environmentally friendly. And I, I know that across FCRC, there are already people that are working on this, right? Uh, there's the, the whole energy workshop and so forth, and plenty of papers elsewhere. But what we wanted to do with our sort of recent focus here is up-level it, uh, encourage the full community to think about it, to bring their tools into the toolkit for it, and in particular, to think broadly about the full life cycle. So I'm a PowerWare architecture researcher uh, from long ago, right? But this isn't just about power. This isn't just about operational energy while my cell phone is on. This is about what was the energy to design, what was the energy and the environmental impact to fab that chip, that system, all the way out to the e-waste. We have extraordinary examples in the NSF portfolio of entire supercomputers being decommissioned cut into parts, not part, not cut into parts, but decommissioned into subcomponents that could then be reused um, in other parts of the world that's, that wanted a, you know, a sort of viable uh, computing system. So how can we improve the reuse of computing systems? Um, 
as well as the other parts of the life cycle. Um, there's huge innovation that's possible essentially across our whole field. And so part of the goal is to encourage folks to, to think across those layers. The right-hand side is obviously also huge, right? And that's where we take our toolkit and we go out to the rest of the world and we say, how can we help? How can this toolkit help? That's analyzing hydropower in the Amazon, um, but so much more, long-term global climate modeling, regional weather modeling, the ability to predict accurately uh, flood and water level rise predictions for the folks that have too much water, uh, predict rainfall for the folks who have too little water, and then engage communities in their climate solutions. So the idea is for there to be a true flow back and forth, and this is the vision. In terms of some programs that we're offering towards that vision, uh, here's one, Design for Environmental Sustainability and Computing. It has that cross-layer notion. It really encourages us to think beyond watts or joules and up to issues of emissions, pollution, um, embodied costs, and so forth. And you can see the details of, you know, there's sort of different funding levels. There's a potential for workshops. Uh, so, you know, if you are an eligible NSFPI, I hope you'll propose. If you're not an eligible NSFPI, I hope this just offers sort of an example of how we approach these issues and how we hope to sort of start broader conversations. Another example of something we're doing for the future is we're standing up an effort that we're calling the National Discovery Cloud for Climate, or NDCC. And this is the idea of trying to bring together at scale resources for cloud-based data modeling and analysis to advance climate-related science and engineering. Uh, we had our first um, Dear Colleague letter or uh, an informal solicitation towards these resources a few months ago. Uh, and we hope to see this NDCC building over time as well. And a, a third call in this area is the national is the NSF Global Centers on Use Inspired Research on Climate Change and Clean Energy. This was an NSF wide thing, um, but we very much believe that the computing community has a lot to stay, say here, and so we hope uh, that you were a part of a proposal. Uh, this was, in fact, it's a global center. This was a multi-country solicitation. We partnered with the UK, Canada, and Australia. And each country uh, put in, uh, put in uh, resources. So there was $5 million over five years offered on the US side, and the international partners fund their side, and then folks worked together on these broad societal challenges. Trust and information, another huge issue, another grand challenge issue. So in terms of going forward, uh, here's one example, maybe kind of focused example, safe learning enabled systems. This is a recent call um, to take the notions of classical safety engineering and bring them to AI systems. So this is recognizing that an AI system has this knack for learning and changing over time, which is one of its superpowers. But on the other hand, if you at design time said that it was provably safe and then it chooses to adapt Further from that, how do you discern that it continues to be provably safe across all the possible adaptations that it might actually enact? How can we maintain strong safety guarantees throughout a learning system's lifetime? So, you know, you can look at this and say, well, that's AI, and, and there's not a quote unquote AI conference here at FCRC, but I would say, come on, right? Uh, PLDI architecture, Sigmetrics, you all have tools for this toolkit. Um, so I hope that you will, again, broaden out, form the communities to, to see how things like this can really bring societal change. Um, here's another thing, again, my goal is to kind of offer some examples of how we approach different aspects of these challenges. The challenge that's being approached here is one of how do we democratize access to the compute and data that's needed to do AI research at scale today. There's a, a smaller and smaller set of individuals and companies that can really be players in this space today. And that's gonna affect, that's gonna shape the results that come out of AI research. And that's something that we need to be concerned about as a society. So 
the goal of the National AI Research Resource is to push back against that by democratizing access, providing data sets, providing high-end computing. Where we are right now is <clears throat> that a public-private task force operated for a year with public discussions. You can watch them, they're all on the web. And a final public report that was ratified in January, the link is there on my slide. And now within the US government, uh, there's a set of working group discussions to talk about a pilot. So one thing I will say is that in this world, and especially in the government, there's an awful lot of PDFs that get generated, right? Um, this is a PDF that has some legs. This is a PDF that could really change our research lives. And I would encourage you to stay aware of this and watch as it grows. Just to give you a sense of scale, the final report articulated a vision with a price tag of around 2.6 billion with a B US dollars. Uh, so they didn't think small. Uh, there are tiny down payments towards this vision in the budget, uh, the FY24 budget for NSF and others, and we'll see where it goes. But the point is to say, if, if there's needs that we have, we should think about a as a community what those needs are and then try to articulate them clearly so that we can go forward together. Um, but I promised you that I would say something about what is truth. And uh, so here I am. Um, information integrity is really a profoundly important topic right now. Uh, information integrity is a somewhat neutral way of referring to things like mis, dis, and malinformation, which are shaping our society, shaping our family discussions, shaping our elections, and so forth. Um, so I want you to know that we, NSF, co-chaired the drafting of a report, a roadmap for researchers on priorities related to information integrity, R&D. Um, it was released on December 31st, 2022. You can make your own decision about why you might release something on New Year's Eve like that. Um, but anyway, it's public, it's out there, and it articulates some of the key challenges that we should all engage in when it comes to this kind of research. Paired with that, uh, NSF issued what we call a DCL, Dear Colleague Letter, to encourage the submission of proposals um, on topics like information manipulation, its consequences, and its socio-technical contexts. So I know, I know that just like differential privacy didn't seem mathematical until uh, the folks who worked on it showed how it could be. I know that there are tools in our toolkit here that can make information integrity and information manipulation something that we can analyze and get a handle on. Uh, and I would encourage you and challenge you to be a part of that. Uh, so on the people side, I'll be brief. Here's my commercial message. <laughs> uh, we have a new fellowship program called CS Grad for US. I think one of the things we're seeing in the US is that fewer of the US educated undergrads in computer science are going on to graduate school in computer science. Clearly, there's a very strong job market, and so not everyone uh, sees the need for a doctoral degree. But we also think that maybe not everyone was set up well in undergrad to think about why a doctoral degree is helpful or could be exciting for them. And so the goal of CS Grad for US is to offer a one-year mentorship program. Uh, here's what graduate school is about, and here's how to apply, and to offer three full years of tuition and stipend support to get someone going in a doctoral program. The goal is to pull people back from wherever they are out in the world after their bachelor's degree to get them to think about a doctoral program in order to in increase the number and diversity of US citizen and permanent resident graduate students in computing fields to really get at that doctoral um, program uh, dropping over time that we're seeing in our trends. Uh, the deadline is June 26th, so I would encourage you to stop paying attention to me for approximately one minute and think about who is the student out in industry who is best suited for this, and please send them a text message or an email right now. Uh, because it would be great to have them apply. We already, from the first two offerings of this fellowship program, are hearing from the people who said, I never thought I could go get a PhD in computing, and now you've changed my life. And you know that's pretty heady stuff to hear, 
we'd love to change a few more lives. Uh, a different kind of people and inclusion has to do with NSF's international partnerships. And the big, you know, 72 point font URL at the bottom gives you the full list of everything that my directorate does in terms of live, active international partnerships right now. Um, but I have a highlights reel up top. Uh, we have an extraordinary um, new partnership with India that has launched. Uh, we signed an implementation arrangement with India earlier this year, and we now have a joint funding opportunity that's available. So a US researcher and a researcher from India can come together, write a single proposal. It goes through a unified review process, and, uh, and the decision is uh, agreed upon. And for those that are funded, NSF funds the US side of the budget, and uh, the India Department of Science and Technology funds uh, the Indian side of the budget. Uh, the target date for that solicitation is August 15th, so you have a little time to work on a proposal to find your partners. Uh, Canada, we've had a long-standing, about a year and a half now, of um, calls for AI and quantum science-related proposals. Uh, same idea with Canada, Germany on cybersecurity, Israel across all size core topics. We've had a, an Israel partnership literally for decades, and many more. So I hope that uh, you will sort of see the opportunities here to work across boundaries to make the right things happen. So I said that this talk would be a call to action, and, and I hope to sort of view this as a start of a conversation. Um, so beyond NSF, I tried throughout the talk to say this isn't really just about NSF. Uh, it's about this broader view. I would love to see a broader set of sort of integration, collaboration, uh, worldwide, but also community-wide. We're 2,600 computing researchers here in this room today. That's awesome. Um, but let's let's also be aware. You know, NeurIPS gets what six, seven thousand. Uh, SIGGRAPH, a few thousand attendees. So there's a whole big part of our community that maybe we aren't talking to as often as we could. How do we find them? How do we sort of find these customers across different parts of the computing space? Um, as well as sort of how do we reach out to uh, the ultimate customers, which might be the climate scientists and so forth. Uh, so zooming in on three aspects of this, sort of what is the role of universities? I would encourage you, as you if you're a university leader, to think about whether the department structures encourage the kinds of cross-topic collaboration that is really the passion of many people in this room and many young people today, uh, and to make, you know, sort of put deep thought into how different types of impact, societal impact, get considered in promotion and tenure. Um, I think on the industry side, uh, our field has a profound partnership with industry, and that's been all to the good. Um, we need to make sure that that partnership stays vibrant and uh, includes support both for internal research at the companies, as well as broader external research and the workforce development that provides the feeders into those companies. And then there's professional societies. Um, and I, I think, uh, you know, what can I say? I can speak to an ACM audience, but often we are all sort of lining up with our hats, right? Is it a SIG ARC hat? or a SIG plan hat or something else. I would love to think about whether there's a chance for broader publication scopes, um, multi-SIG, super-SIG models, or you know, sort of uh, SIGs that really do span um, more use-inspired or societal challenge-related topic areas so that we can all feed into them um, and provide the publication opportunities that might make the, the university-style problems less vexing in the short term. So these are just some ideas. As I said, my goal was to start a conversation. Um, I really thank you for your time and your attention. And with that, I am happy to field some questions. So my question is rooted somewhat in public policy and what computer science needs to do about it. 
you spoke about differential uh, privacy and information integrity, but I want to focus on uh, information veracity in the age of social media and chat GPT. The society, policy question is the societal information of the ability to trust the information around us. No different than we trust the food that is on our grocery shelves, its economic impact. And then from there, we want to fall down to as to what tool set computer science community needs to produce so that we have an environment in which we can trust in inf information around us. Sure. So I think the question is, is about, you know, sort of how does the tool set, the technical tool set link out to policy expectations? So whether you call it information veracity or truth or information integrity or mistis malinformation, I don't want to kind of oversimplify, but I think to some extent people are using different words just to get around kind of frankly some lightning rods in the space. Um, but having said that, we all, I think we hopefully all appreciate how impactful these issues are in our lives. Um, there is a sort of technical to policy gap that needs to be closed. Uh, and we can pull from examples like differential privacy to be motivated to know that we have figured out how to close those in the past. Uh, in some cases, some folks are going to need to be explainers. In the case of differential privacy, some of those researchers literally went into the US Census Bureau to help them think through these issues in a particular context. Um, we can also see this through companies that choose to decide how to enact different aspects of this information within their systems. And many of those companies attend conferences like this. So the opportunity is there to close either that policy, the, the sort of government policy gap or the corporate policy gap. And um, I think those conversations need to happen. And if you could, uh, I guess the next question's over there. And if you could right. say your name and affiliation, that would be great. For sure. Hi, uh, I'm Avid. Uh, thanks for the great talk. This is Anish from Georgia Tech. So uh, towards the end, you mentioned uh, collaboration opportunities with international institutions. So as an international grad student, I was wondering what are your thoughts on um, you know, fellowships and funding opportunities for international grad students in the US because NSF does have fellowship programs for US citizens. Sure, so the question is about international students and fellowships. And uh, I always start my answer to this question by noting, I am the kid of an immigrant refugee scientist, so I 100%, 1,000% believe in the value of um, what we get when we come together as scientists across different citizenships. Uh, I'll give you a number. So NSF has a graduate fellowship program. Uh, it makes around 2,000 awards a year, of which about 150 go to computer science topic areas. Our CS Grad for US program is new, it makes, well, let's say another 50. So that's order 200 awards that are limited to US citizens and permanent residents. Uh, the other half of this are the graduate students that we support through research assistantships on the many NSF funded awards that fund about 80% of the federal funding for academic CS research in America. That's around 6,000 graduate students without any uh, citizenship expectations whatsoever. So 6,000 anywhere in the world, come, we love you. 200 aimed at different sort of policy goals around increasing US engagement in doctoral studies. Excellent, thanks. Now from the other side, please. Thanks for the great talk, Margaret. Um, this is Rachet from Cornell. So you were talking about funding and one thing I'm wondering about is the NSF and you, are, are you folks thinking about how to scale the process of deciding who gets funding, how to make it more equitable, um, and again, uh, we, so that we can fund more creative research, uh, more useful research for the rest of us? Thanks. Okay, so it was about funding, scaling, equitable, creative. There was a lot to unpack in that one. Uh, so one of the things that I like to say, or I don't like to say it, but I end up saying it at this point, is I lead a directorate with a $1 billion a year budget. That's an extraordinary opportunity and responsibility. Here's the other part. We decline another billion dollars a year of highly rated proposals. 
So we could basically fund a whole other directorate just with the highly rated proposals that come out of our review process, not, not the others. So we are always operating under constraints in terms of trying to be scalable and in tr terms of trying to get ideas funded fast so you can get started. We do have programs like Eagers that let uh, scientists with a specific focused idea come in at relatively low funding at levels to get started on something. Uh, and we try, you saw that slide with the different mechanisms we use. We try strongly to do a mix of mechanisms at different scales. And we try strongly to ensure an equitable review process through a peer review, merit review process that uh, seeks to both bring experts in, but also ensure um, a broad set of viewpoints on the review panels. Uh, and finally, the program officers at NSF, many of whom are in the room, are extraordinarily expert at considering portfolios. So yes, the reviewers offer insights. We also try to think about different portfolio gaps with respect to both topical gaps and other kinds of sort of geographic and demographic inclusion to create a portfolio overall that makes sense. Thanks. Thank you. Now we can take now from your left. Um, hi, my name is Keshav. I'm a professor at the University of Cambridge. Uh, Margaret, thanks for your talk. I just have a comment. Uh, I'm glad to see that the NSF is taking such a leadership role in climate and sustainability. Uh, attendees here would might be interested in knowing uh, ACME Energy, which is the Energy and Sustainability Conference, is also one of the parts of FCRC, and we also have uh, uh, SIG Energy, ACM has approved SIG Energy. So if you're interested in these topics, please do join us. Uh, and we have a workshop today, uh, several workshops today on this topic. So that is just an ad for our conference. Thank you. Thanks, and I, I think that's a great example of kind of cross-cutting SIGs than many others. SIG uh, folks should be thinking about and how to couple into. So it's awesome that you mentioned it. Thank you. From the right now, please. Uh, Jen Lee from uh, uh, Futurate Technologies. Uh, first, thank you so much for the inspiring uh, talk, Professor. Um, I guess my question is following up the second question from uh, Georgia Tech um, on the people and the, the world's food talents. To be specific, like, how do you think uh, NSF should encourage and engage like uh, researchers from all over the world, regardless of their geolocations and origins in the current and the continuing uh, geopolitical issues. Thank you. Sure. So as I said, I mean, we're a US funding agency, so we fund research that happens in the US. But having said that, the, the people that we fund, the graduate students that we fund, and the faculty that we fund at US institutions are of many, many dozens, hundreds of citizenships, right? Uh, because the vast majority of our funding does not um, even take account of where you're a citizen. So in that sense, uh, within the mission of fostering US research, it is very much agnostic to uh, country of origin. Uh, we also recognize that the US research ecosystem cannot succeed, cannot operate in isolation. And international partnerships are not just sort of a, a, a nice thing, they're an essential thing for getting the right science done. And that means a range of collaborations all over the world. And if you look at who um, our NSF funded researchers co-author papers with, you can see that the co-authoring relationships are literally worldwide, um, including very rich, robust partnerships, co-authoring papers um, with scientists in China. <laughs> Go ahead on the other side, please. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk, Margaret. My name is uh, Akshita Sriraman. I'm from Carnegie Mellon University. Um, I love the fact that you brought in the people and the societal aspects of research into your talk. And one of the things I want to point out is a lot of times in our computing communities, whenever we are saying we want to build systems for um, the society, we're always focusing on the top percentage of the world's population or 
specifically here, the US population, and not really focusing on the rest of the community, particularly rural communities, that we don't really build systems for often. And so I wonder what your thoughts are in terms of what the community should be doing towards bridging the digital divide, because there are so many challenges in terms of lack of energy grids and cost and um, energy um, availability and so forth. So how do we enable accessibility, affordability um, across the board for rural communities and not just for a select person of the population? Oh, that's such a wonderful question, and that's another call to action. Um, so NSF, we do have investments. Uh, for example, we have a Platforms for Advanced Wireless Research or Power Testbed uh, led by Iowa State University that's specifically on um, enabling research towards more affordable rural broadband access. That's one example. Um, I, you know, many folks in the community have done work on internet access in disconnected regions and on intermittent power access of computing devices. And so we do fund that in different ways, either on the sustainability side or on the wireless networking side. Um, I think the other thing that I can mention here is that while many of our international partnerships are with the countries who bring the resources to fund their side of the research, there are other opportunities that we are working on to work with other US agencies that have the ability to fund in a broader set of countries around the world. So for example, to improve the sort of research collaborations into the many parts of the world where the country itself doesn't have its version of the NSF at, at the same scale to, to fund their side of the collaboration. And yet the work is really important, both for that country and frankly, for sort of bringing up the world's understanding of how these technology issues affect us all. Thank you for mentioning that. Thank you. We can go now from the other side. Uh, thank you for a great talk. My name is Bora Nikolic and I come from the US University of California at Berkeley. I have a follow-up question about uh, CS education in high schools. I think it is phenomenal that CS education has penetrated into high schools. But at the same time, it is a zero-sum game with respect to science and now math credits. So my daughter is a rising senior in high school, and uh, what I've noticed in her school, computer science or computing classes basically displaced a physics class. Next year, she signed up to take a data science class, which will displace advanced math class, which is not so advanced uh, already. At the same time, there was no change in humanities, in history requirements, or English, or languages. What is your take on that? <laughs> That's an interesting question. Uh, so I'll tell a story. I did some of my schooling, kindergarten through ninth grade, in the state of Missouri. And so while other parts of the US would have been taking world history, I was taking Missouri history. Um, so I would argue that there are tons of trade-offs in our K through 12 curriculum. I kind of wish I knew more about world history and maybe less about Lewis and Clark. Um, back to your question. Uh, so I think there's an issue first of access and opportunity. Uh, and then from that, we can sort of layer on top of that. The, you know, to me, it's like a policy versus mechanism kind of thing. Let's at least say that at the mechanism level, there are CS courses available broadly across the US because frankly, that was not true not so long ago. Then we can layer on top of that the policy issues of where to give students choice and where not to give students choice and um, how to layer it across the different uh, STEM topic areas, perhaps expanding STEM ex expectations um, in flexibility against other expectations or offering different choices. I'm not an education policy person, um, but I, I would hate for us to opt out of offering CS education just to ensure more people got physics, right? We need to come up with some up, uh, set of approaches that lets people have the opportunity at both and then figure out how to manage it. Now from this side, please, on the left. Karthik Sriram, Yale University. Uh, on the topic of uh, building trust and in information, we can build technology to help with that, but people may still not trust information just because they don't understand the technology. What do you think we can do as a community to educate people on technology? And more specifically, 
do you think this community should do it or do you think it should be exported out in some say in some way i'll answer the last question first yes absolutely this community should be doing it and frankly a lot of communities should be doing it we need to explain to the world uh, what our science is and why it matters and we need to help people trust in the process of science overall as well as in the systems that the computing community develops uh, and i think we all need to be ready to be interpreters and pathfinders for a broader set of folks your neighbors um, in the apartment building where you live and others need to um, have interpretation of what they're seeing in the headlines today that is not just at the sort of sci-fi level, but that actually gets sort of underpinning into technology. The other thing I would say is, you know, we have a reputation for being a field uh, that goes after things because we could do it, right? And I think we need to shape our reputation towards being a field where, yeah, we go after the things we could do, but we also think about, should we do it? And so it, 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 it's both about exploring opportunities, but also showing that we have some judiciousness about both the opportunities we choose to explore and why, and we're ready to explain that to a broader audience. Thank you. And we'll take our last question uh, from the side, yes. Uh, hi, Margaret. I'm, I'm very glad that you chose this topic and, and scope for your talk. We have lots of technical talks, I think, and listening to, listening to a high-level policy talk from you is, I think, extremely valuable. My question, uh, by the way, my name is Vikram Ardway. I'm from the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. My question is about the current state of funding for research in topics like generative AI. I, as I'm sure you've been asked many times, I think that we're in a situation right now, obviously, where industry has just tremendous resources and it's driving innovation in this area at a pace that makes it very hard for academic researchers to keep up and even to be able to, in fact, I hear people being discouraged about it, about investing in this. But at the same time, I feel like even no government program um, really has the ability to compete in terms of the size of funding. And so the billion dollars you mentioned as a potential thing for NAIRR, will be relatively small, um, comparatively speaking, if you think about how much industry is investing. So it seems to me that there is a need for policy approaches to get more collaborative efforts between industry and academia. And um, if there are ways to motivate that, I would love to hear about them. I feel like this is a place where maybe NSF could take a leadership role in trying to 